Can you speak ape? Trick question. You are an ape, so any type of speech coming out of a human is technically speaking ape. But I guess what I'm really asking is, can you speak the language that other apes speak? I guess that's kind of loaded too, isn't it? Do other apes have language? And does a language need to be spoken for it to be a language? I think the answer to the second question is a very obvious no, as humans all across the world utilize sign language to communicate. And not only that, but it seems as though there is a shared gestural repertoire regardless of where you go in the world. For instance, if I point at something, every human anywhere is going to understand that I'm trying to draw your attention to wherever it is that I'm pointing. Let's back up a minute. Language and gestures are both types of communication, put very simply, although they are very complicated types of communication. Still, Complicated communication, whether it's with gestures or vocalization, is pretty much the primate MO, because humans are not the only ones who do it. Researchers and science communicators alike tend to draw a pretty distinct line between language and the types of complicated communication employed by other primates, and I think there's a pretty good reason for doing this, namely that human language involves talking about symbolic things and also referring to events and objects through space and time, which is something that we haven't documented extensively in other primates yet. And I think there's no denying that human languages are really a special type of communication, right? We've taken vocalizations and just dialed them up to 11. However, I would be remiss to not take a moment and appreciate complex forms of communication that other primates utilize. I've talked about these many times on the channel, but it's especially relevant for the paper that we're going to be looking at today. The differences between human languages and the ways that other primates communicate seems to be one of degree rather than kind, as we'll see in a moment. So first of all, gelatas, which are a type of cercopithecid monkey, an old world monkey that lives in the highlands of Ethiopia, they have forms of communication, sort of chittering and chattering at one another, that follow human linguistic laws, specifically Zips and Menzerath's laws of efficiency. Campbell's monkeys and vervet monkeys both utilize syntax in their communication. For example, one might make a call that means predator, and the subsequent call might mean from above, meaning it's a crowned eagle, or from below, meaning it's a leopard. The subsequent call is altering the meaning of the first, giving it more information. Now, interestingly enough, the previous three primates that I mentioned, Campbell's monkeys, vervets, and gelatas, are all cercopithecids, so they're members of the Cercopithecidae family. They're not apes. Hominids are interesting in a different way. Because hominids communicate with vocalizations, yes, but we also utilize gestures all across the board. And chimpanzees and bonobos are famous for this. These guys have a gestural repertoire of over 80 different signs. Now, I can't think of 80 gestures that could convey meaning innately to another human off the top of my head. But a very interesting study from a few years back noted that human toddlers actually have a lot of gestures that they utilize to convey meaning to their mom or their siblings or their dad. And the study found that human toddlers share about 90% of their gestural repertoire with chimpanzees and bonobos, the catalog at that time. So what's the difference between me and a baby? Why does a baby have such a heavy overlap with panins and I don't? Well, it's because babies are pre-verbal. They can't talk yet. So this creates a really fascinating hypothetical, doesn't it? We have our old world monkeys, and the ones today are decently analogous in many ways to the stem cataracts that we see before the appearance of the apes. They're utilizing things like simple vocalization, simple in the primate context, not in the mammal context. But once we see the arrival of the apes, these guys have dexterous wrists and hands and highly mobile fingers. This is originally so that they can maneuver through the trees, but this is accepted in order to communicate using gestures, which is facilitated by their growing brain case size thanks to increased pressures due to larger group sizes and maneuvering through a 3D environment. It's been argued that what happened with the hominins is we have a critter with an increasing brain case size with higher demands of sociality, maybe due in part to a change in its environment coming from the trees, moving down onto the ground, as well as the advent of things like simple tools, and you apply it backwards onto this scaffold of gestural communication. 
Well, the second this thing is capable of vocalizing in a myriad of new different ways, you're just going to take that gestural scaffold and apply it onto verbal communication. And you have language. You might be wondering, why not just stick with gestures? And the answer is because, well, speech allows you to communicate across large distances. I can shout across the landscape. And that might be advantageous if you're beginning to hunt big game. So now we come back to our human baby, a little hominid that is pretty dang smart and getting smarter all the times it takes in the world around it, but is incapable of speech. It is entirely nonverbal because its larynx hasn't descended. It needs to communicate somehow, and so it falls back on that gestural scaffold. Hence why we have a match of 90% with human babies and non-human apes. This is a sequence of events that is supported by the fossil record and a lot of the genes that we've sequenced in relation to language, as well as the morphology and physiology of modern hominids and circopithecines alike. But it leads to a really interesting question. What happened to adult humans' ability to interpret these gestures? What if we can still do it? Well, that's exactly what Graham and Hobader attempted to figure out in their recently published paper titled Towards a Great Ape Dictionary, Inexperienced Humans Understand Common Non-Human Ape Gestures. So let's dig into this because I think it's really fascinating. As always with these, we'll read the abstract first and pick our way through the paper. They say, in the comparative study of human and non-human communication, Ape gesturing provided the first demonstrations of flexible, intentional communication outside of human language. Rich repertoires of these gestures have been described in all ape species bar one, us. Now, I think this is interesting because as I mentioned earlier, there are innate human gestures that are appreciated across all human populations. I think what the authors are talking about here is sort of a shared large system of gestural communication that doesn't need to be taught. I think it's the size here that they're that they're referring to. They go on, given that the majority of grade A gestural signals are shared and their form appears biologically inherited, this creates a conundrum. Where did the ape gestures go in human communication? Now, they're gonna talk about this a little bit later because obviously I've read the paper already, but they mention the fact that human toddlers can appreciate this type of gestural communication system. So where does it go in adults is really the question that they're asking. Here we test human recognition and understanding of 10 of the most frequently used ape gestures. We crowdsourced from 5,656 participants through an online game, which required them to select the meaning of chimpanzee and bonobo gestures in 20 videos. We showed that humans may retain an understanding of ape gestural communication, either directly inherited or part of a more general uh, cognition, across gesture types and gesture meanings, with information on communicative context providing only a marginal improvement in success. By assessing comprehension rather than production, we accessed part of the great ape gestural repertoire for the first time in adult humans. So that's the critical portion right there. Cognitive access to an ancestral system of gesture appears to have been retained after our diversion from other apes, drawing deep evolutionary continuity between their communication and our own. So that's a lot. Let's get into it. Okay, so we'll jump around here and there. This first little bit talks about how most scientists and philosophers alike consider the apparent discontinuity between human language and non-human communication as this kind of evolutionary puzzle. Uh, the author's going to say more and more research has started to unveil the deep phylogenetic roots of language. So what we're looking at with modern language is kind of a terminal horizontal slice of things, but this has been a long time coming, at least according to the work that we've done so far looking at other primates and the types of communication they use. So the authors specify here that there is definitely a difference between the types of uh, sort of communication that a lot of other animals utilize, which tends to be like response stimulus. And they note that humans do this too. For example, when you pick up a pan that's too hot, you're going to involuntarily yelp. You don't think to yourself, I would like to convey that this pan is hot to everyone else. And they typically contextualize this here as being like alarm calls, like those vervets that are talking about seeing a predator from the ground or from the air. Yeah, they are communicating to one another, but they're seeing a predator and it's like, oh my god, there's a, there's an eagle. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's not necessarily um, how might I best convey this information to my peers, which is something that humans tend to do. Um, they contextualize this by saying human language's intentional nature takes it beyond sharing information. It communicates meaning. 
This fundamental property is rarely observed in other species, and when it is, it is typically restricted to one or two signals used in highly specified ways. Um, the papers that they cite here have to do with signaling and receiving in communication. I believe they're talking mostly about the great apes, but they might include like cetaceans and proboscideans, so elephants and things like that in there. They move on to say, strikingly, great ape gestures are used in this language-like way. Rich systems of over 80 signals deployed communicate everyday goals, and ape gesturing has been suggested to be an important scaffold in the evolution of human language. Great ape repertoire shows substantial overlap across species, including overlap among ape species more distantly related than chimpanzees, bonobos, and humans. So they're talking about like orangs and uh, gorillas there. As a result, we would expect humans to retain the use of this system of ape gestural communication, but to date, the use of naturalistic ape gestures appear to be absent in communication, in human communication. Humans are highly gestural, so this is kind of what we were talking about earlier, deploying <laughs> decetic, iconic, conventional, and co-speech cosign, among other types of gestures. However, this itself is part of what makes studying gestural overlap between adult humans and other apes challenging. Gestures shared with other apes may be masked by the myriad of ways that humans signal with their hands and bodies. They talk about pointing and things like that. Um, and they do appreciate sort of what we talked about earlier down here. They say recent studies suggested that pre-verbal one to two-year-old human children, infants, human children and infants, were found to deploy over 50 gestures from the ape repertoire. Given the available movement of body parts, there are well over 1,000 potential gestures that could be produced with the ape body, but apes only use approximately 12% of these. Thus, and this is a critical portion of their hypothesis here, any overlap between species is very unlikely to be trivial. Here, we provide the first test of the hypothesis that language component, excuse me, language competent adult humans still share access to this family typical great ape gesture. So they're looking at great ape gestures, which there's a lot of different shared gestures amongst chimps, bonobos, gorillas, and orangutans, and indeed, in chimps and bonobos, at least, there is a 90%, it's 89, but I usually just round up because it's a cooler sounding number. 90% of that gestural overlap occurs with those panins and with human children. So the question is, how much overlap exists between panins and adult humans? These authors are suggesting that this is a difficult question to answer in part because of human masking that happens basically because humans are really flexible and adaptable. Our gestures might not be a one-to-one -one for the other great apes because of context, language, culture, a myriad of different things. So they decide to take it in the opposite way. Can humans interpret the gestures of other apes? Okay, so what did they do? How did they actually test this? We selected the 10 most common gesture types for which we were previously able to confirm meaning in both chimps and bonobos, determined by the recipient responses that consistently satisfy the signaler. Okay, so this is really important, right? What they've done. They picked the 10 most common gestures for which we know the meaning of through frequent observation in chimps and bonobos. So this way we can accurately test whether or not humans are even accurately interpreting the signals, one, but they've also picked the most common types, which you know presumably should be the easiest for humans to understand, despite that sort of distant divergence in the past. Chimpanzees and bonobos are humans' closest living relatives. We are also theirs, with a split of humans more recent than the last common ancestor shared between pan and gorilla. So they're basically noting that this is also kind of ideal to pick chimps and bonobos because they're our closest living relatives and we are theirs. There should be more overlap there than there is between chimps and gorillas or chimps and bonobos versus orangutans. They also note here that the majority of the gesture types, six of the chimp and seven of the bonobo, have like one meaning, whereas some of them could have multiple meanings. These were sort of cataloged as ambiguous gesture types. Participants viewed one instance in which the correct outcome was the primary meaning, and one instance where the correct outcome was the alternate meaning. And in both cases, we're given primary and alternate meanings as potential answers. So this is another important portion. It's multiple choice. They're, they're not doing like written response what does the chimpanzee mean when it does this and sticks its hand out? Okay, so what were the results? So they had a lot of participants overall, 17,751 people, but they specifically looked at 5,656 participants who completed all of the videos. So I guess that sort of keeps continuity within the experiment. Participants correctly interpreted the meanings of chimpanzee and bonobo gestures with or without contextual information with a success rate of 
plus or minus 11.9%. So that is high, actually. <laughs> Okay, so here's our first figure that sort of exemplifies that 57 plus or minus 11%. The success is on the y-axis with one being 100% and zero being 0%. And on the x-axis, we see um, the gestures, right? And then they are color-coded as ambiguous or unambiguous based off of whether more than one meaning could be sort of gleaned from that gesture. And looking at this, the reason why I say that that 57 plus or minus 11% is high is because like a lot of these gestures aren't really relevant to humans, right? Things like present genital. This is something that, you know, females will typically do when they are tumescent, like when they're in estrus. Humans don't have estrus. Editing Erica here. Humans obviously have estrus. I meant we have concealed ovulation, so our estrus isn't visible externally to one another, right? And yet we're getting a pretty high upper end of the, um, of the gesture interpretation there. Also things like climbing on one's back, right? Present climb. This is something that human kids don't do anymore. So this is something that like we haven't also done for a long time, right? Humans have not been persistent uh, climbers having their kids on our back for like maybe 2 million years, maybe even older. The fact that we can still interpret this many, you know, almost panin specific gestures is really interesting and suggests that that shared appreciation for those uh, innate gestures is very old indeed. Let's keep reading. They say across gesture types, the addition of information on behavioral context had at best marginal positive effect on participant success. More specifically, the only, only the interaction between context and ambiguity showed any possible effect with an again weak, non-significant trend towards improved participant success, where gesture meaning was classed as ambiguous and informational context was available. Participants showed a small but significant increase in confidence in their responses for gestures with a single content or single correct meaning, excuse me, than for ambiguous gestures. So this little paragraph packs a lot of info and it's really interesting, important information at that. The fact that context doesn't significantly impact um, the, uh, the participant's success most of the time is fascinating because that suggests, again, that this is something rather innate, not something that is learned. Like I see a chimpanzee do that. I, you know, apply, I access my human knowledge of what chimpanzees do and what I know about them. And then I interpret the gestures. It seems as if most of the time humans look at it and they're like, oh, of course, this means X, Y, Z. <laughs> Accessing our 7 million year old ancient dictionary of ape gestures. Interestingly enough, confidence was higher as well for non-ambiguous gestures, right? These participants were inexperienced. They don't know which gestures are ambiguous and which ones are classified as unambiguous. The fact that they are more hesitant for the ambiguous rather than unambiguous gestures means, again, on some level, they know that just as if they were a chimp, right? Some of these gestures could mean one or two things. And in the ancient Miocene landscape, you're going to want to get that right. So you're going to be less confident if there are more options than if you know culturally, innately, that there is only one. That's really cool that we still retain that confidence level on ambiguous versus unambiguous. They go on and say, within ambiguous gestures where participants failed to select the correct meaning for this specific instance of communication, results were mixed as to whether they were more likely to select the secondary meaning for the gesture than an incorrect meaning not associated with the gesture type. In three out of five gesture types, participants did not select the alternative meaning significantly above chance. Notably, object shake gesture is the only gesture for which participants failed to assign either the primary or alternate meaning. That's also interesting because going back up to the methods section, object shake is used to initiate copulation, meaning let's have sex. Isn't it interesting that the one of the more difficult um, interpretations, gestures for humans to interpret, is about copulation in a species that is fission, fusion, and polygamous. This kind of falls a little bit in line with the hypothesis that pretty early on in hominins, we become pair bonded and relatively monogamous, for which an object shake gesture in a group, right, which is the context in which this gesture exists, would kind of cease to have meaning because you don't need to gesture to your mate, the individual who you're, you know, in, at least in this case, ostensibly the only one you're having intercourse with. 
And we're going to read the full discussion because it's not very long. It's just these three paragraphs stopping and adding, you know, thoughts as we go. Until now, humans have presented a problematic gap in the study of great ape gesture, with comparative observational methods limited to early development because of the feasibility of observing gesture production in humans after the onset of language. By deploying a playback method that flips the paradigm for the study of gesture, produ or gesture production to gesture comprehension, we have accessed great ape gestural communication in adult humans for the first time. Participants were substantially above chance at correctly assigning the correct meaning to chimpanzee and bonobo gestures across types, suggesting that humans may have retained their understanding of the core features of a gestural system present in our last common ancestor with the pan genus six to seven million years ago. This ability was present across both the functionally more fixed and the flexible gestures that are deployed with more than one meaning. Participants were highly successful at detecting meaning for which gestures were used in the specific instance of communication that they saw. Where gesture had alternate meanings, these were also detected more often than chance in two gesture types. That our participants were able to predict and interpret primate signal complements the recent findings that suggest humans may be able to perceive effective cues in primate vocalization. So this is the idea that like this might also apply to vocalizations, not just gestures, which kind of blows my mind a little bit. And again, interestingly enough, the only gesture that we consistently have failed is one that is pretty innate to the mating system and social system type exhibited by tannins. They go on to say the underlying mechanism that makes gestural communication comprehensible across great ape species, now including humans, remains unsolved. Human use of gesture as intertwined with language in diverse ways makes detecting gesture types from the ape repertoire difficult. It remains unknown whether the great ape repertoire itself is biologically inherited or whether apes, now including humans, share an underlying ability to produce and interpret naturally meaningful signals that are mutually understandable because of a general intelligence and shared body plans with social goals. So is it innate and phylogenetic or is what is innate and phylogenetic our body plan and intelligence? And that itself facilitates the understanding of gestures. This is the question. They say, these are not the only possible explanations. For example, gestures could be biologically inherited in non-human apes, but understood by humans through other cognitive mechanisms. We need to continue to develop innovative methods such as these video playbacks to address remaining unknowns. I think this is unlikely that they are inherited biologically in non-human apes, but understood by humans through kind of our big brains, because little babies can do it, right? Little babies, well, we don't know that they comprehend them, but they innately utilize them. And they finish by saying, our findings add a substantial new thread of evidence to the continuity of communication throughout our hominin lineage. And we propose that this novel citizen science playback approach will become a powerful and fruitful tool for bridging gaps in the study of comparative communication. Personally, I'm not very surprised by these results at all, but I am surprised by sort of the scope of the results. Obviously, or I guess it seems obvious to me anyways, we should share gestures with other animals that we're closely related to and specifically that have the dexterous mobile hands that we have. But the fact that the panins and humans that we share so much of a gestural overlap and that humans even are in, a, in our adult form can interpret the gestures of these closely related hominids to us even in the context of their social systems and their dominance hierarchies, not our own, is very interesting indeed, and not something that I would have at all um, thought would be the case. I think a lot of the naysayers to this study are going to appeal to like human inference and say that humans, of course humans can infer what other apes mean when they utilize certain gestures, we're cognitive. And culturally, we see apes all the time doing things in cartoons and TV shows and things like that. But I think if you hear that from someone, they probably haven't read the paper because one, the gestures are pretty convoluted. It's not as simple as like pointing at something or holding your hand out to mean, you know, I want this. These are pretty specific gestures. And indeed, many of them are specific to chimps. And to take it to the next level, right, they used inexperienced uh, human participants, right? And like, you know, I hate to burst the bubble of some of the folks who might be watching this, but it's a hard pill to swallow most people don't know very much about other apes or primates in general. So I would very much enjoy, like I would enjoy presenting this test to like my students and I would like to see if they could interpret it as well. The bottom line is as apes, as hominids, we are indeed included in the shared gestural repertoire across our family. 
and not just in our infancy or during our sort of uh, toddlerhood, but into adulthood as well. And I think this quite nicely presents how deep these shared similarities are, all the way down to our communication style uh, through our development. A really interesting test would be if you could somehow figure out how to administer this to gorillas and see if gorillas perform better or worse than human children or better or worse than human adults, but I don't really even know how you would do that. Anyways, my gentle and of course very modern apes, thank you so much for watching, and if you enjoy this kind of content, please consider supporting me by subscribing, leaving a like, leaving a comment, or head on over to my Patreon if you want to do so monetarily. Obviously everything helps, and I don't think I haven't noticed that more people are joining the Patreon now that I've started asking. In the meantime, please do take care of yourselves.